Hi, I'm John McNee, editor of Forestry Journal. I'm here at St John's Church, south of Balahulish, to talk to Callum Duffy for the first APF virtual blog. The subject up for discussion, chainsaw competency. Callum Duffy has been a forestry contractor for over 30 years and has several chainsaw technicians working for him with a range of experience, knowledge and skill levels. It takes time to monitor how everyone is performing and provide the necessary opportunities for the lower level technicians to progress through. Recording this journey is vitally important. Okay, trees down, safe. During an HSE visit in February 2019, Callum was scrutinised for his inability to prove his operator's competence levels other than showing their qualifications. And at that time I just had their certification and I also had day diaries which was, they were filled in by hand. Um, so I was told that that was inadmissible and it could be faked very easily, which is true. Um, and you could go back retrospectively and fill in a sort of a day diary if you like, you know. So. At that time, I thought, well, if I keep being asked this question, I'm never going to be able to answer that question in a way that I feel comfortable about. Um, so I started looking into the way other people, uh, sorry, other countries are doing it and other industries. So um, I got a bit of information from WorkSafe BC and they seem to have a very good system there that was moving towards competency. They're not there yet, but they're significantly further on than we were. So that was to kind of level out the level of competence of an operator. So looking at what we had here and the training structure, it didn't seem that difficult to be able to kind of put something together that would uh, marry up the current training, but then put in a consolidation time and process between the training, almost like an apprenticeship. But a lot of the guys who worked for me were already fully qualified. So they'd kind of missed that Sort of process if you like. I knew they were competent but I couldn't really prove it. So that was when I thought right we need to have some more evidence, you know, evidence or toolbox talks, the, these talks that I'm having with the fellas, what are you doing today? And they would tell you in great detail what they're doing today but there was no record of that. He took this as a challenge and together with forestry trainer Stephen Hales set out to develop a system that would categorise the skill level and competency of a chainsaw operator using the existing training qualifications provided. It didn't take them long to realise they needed a way to record this process, and a paper-based approach would not do. They decided to look into developing an app which would run alongside the chainsaw competency system. They called it Safe Forestry. We're always challenged uh, in this industry to prove that we're competent, and it's a very difficult thing to do and rather than just being able to flash the certificates, the safe forestry system, when you're involved with that, you, you get your own individual profile. So it's like an ongoing CV of your work. So every small piece of um, a activity that you do is recorded. So that is a piece of competence. It's a small piece, but it all adds up to a much bigger picture of that individual and how competent they are to be doing that specific task. And not only that, as a business, you are able to evidence that you're following legislation as in maintaining your machinery um, through pure checks and th things like that. So if you have um, fitters coming in, you can record that. You can take a, we obviously work with Skyline, so um, we have a lot of consumables in the job. So we can prove that we're inspecting the equipment. If we have an equipment that is damaged, we can say this has been removed from service, been replaced with this one. So that is an ongoing pure check of the equipment. So we can record all that, whereas before we were, we were doing it and we were maintaining our machines, but we had no record of proof of that. So in the worst case scenario, when something was to fail and um, injure someone or, or something like that, you could say, well, that equipment was checked on such and such a date by such and such a person and it was fit for purpose at that point. So it's been able to sort of micromanage your, uh, your system rather than sort of saying, oh, it's fine, we checked it last month and it was okay then. So it just gives a far more um, in-depth look at what you're doing. You know, I, I don't doubt for a minute that most contractors are doing all of this. You know, and, and everyone I speak to, they are doing it, but they just aren't recording it. So if that bad accident was to happen or whatever, they would have no proof that they were actually doing what they say they were doing. And that's very frustrating 
when you're challenged at the time, you know, and you say, well, I did do that, but then, well, can you prove it? No, I can't, so, well, you didn't do it. So that, that's the way it works, you know, whereas this system, you have evidence that you did do that. And, <coughs> you know, with diffused pollution, things like that, it's very high in the industry at the moment. You can show the mitigation you put in place before the event got completely out of hand. You know, or, or you can say, well, I did try up to that point, you know, I put this in, I put that in, you know, and there's evidence. It's really important to have that behind you. So, unfortunately, I, I know that from first-hand experience. That, and this is what this system's been built for, is to protect me as an employer, the guys on the ground as employees and staff, and I have got that information now that I did the best I could. The Chainsaw Competency System has been agreed as a way forward by the FISA Steering Group, is hosted on the FISA website as a live document and will be refined as further industry feedback is given. Meanwhile, Safe Forestry continues to develop into a holistic system providing contractors, management companies, loan operators, landowners and others with the ability to easily record and access data on any aspect of their forestry operations. Callum sees it as the answer to a lot of difficult questions for contractors. He now uses it daily and feels it provides a level of cover for his business he previously never had. While it's true many within the industry are yet to be convinced, the fundamental requirement by law is you must be able to show evidence that you are monitoring operator competence, and this is something Safe Forestry lets you do on multiple levels. Well, we wanted to hear your questions for Callum, so we asked on social media, and we've got quite a few here for you, um, from people within the industry who want to ask uh, how this could affect them or impact the way that they do business. The first question I have here, what's the difference going to be from how things are done at the moment exactly? I think we need to remember what, what it is, John. You know, um, this was um, built for for my business, yeah? And it, it is not a mandatory requirement. And so the simple answer to this is there's going to be no difference at the moment until this, if someone takes this on, obviously they'll be working differently, but it's not mandatory. You don't have to do it. Um, and maybe the perception that's been given across at the moment, because it's been hosted by our, um, by FISA, you know, that people are thinking it's going to land at their doorstep and they're not going to know how to get there. That's entirely not the case. You know, we need to be able to give people the resources to be able to get towards a competency-based system. So what I would say is don't panic. Uh, nothing's going to change anytime soon. And that um, just to continue doing what you're doing, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, FISA would be the place to go or, you know, speak to me personally. I can reassure you that it's not going to do any effect to your current workings. Mm. So unless you're specifically pursuing it, the answer is there's no difference? No difference. No. Okay. Um, for those who do want to use it, how do you go about marking? What about veterans? How do you gauge what a good fella is? Well, I think we all know what a good fella is, you know, if we've been in the industry long enough. Um, I have quite a few veterans within my squad. So we are, what I did was, um, obviously I spoke to them and we have a company audit so um, they were all quite happy to engage with that that audit is something that that my company has um, designed so each veteran went through the audit process and came out with a, a chainsaw technician level from that so that's how I dealt with my veterans how the industry decides to deal with a competency-based system has yet to be um, discussed I would hope that it would be a very open and transparent discussion with the industry and veterans within the industry and at certain systems in other countries go for grandfather rights but just because you're a grandfather doesn't mean to say you've been doing it right all your life there has to be some kind of um, quality assurance with that you know so again don't worry you know that this is all yet to come out mm. um, so yeah hopefully that and how, how you what was it how do you how do you gauge what a good fella is? So, yeah, that would be your audit process, you know. Um, we have um, MPTC syllabuses and Lantra syllabuses that that's what your training is, so you're gauged on that. So it would be something similar. Do you only see this applying to chainsaw operators in the forestry sector, or could it um, expand to encompass uh, people working in arboriculture primarily? Again, this um, system was designed by me, who is a, I am a commercial chainsaw operator. 
um, we do a little bit of arb work with the spar trees, that kind of thing, which is uh, put into our audit. The guys that are climbers get audited on their climbing ability. It was never um, designed for arboriculture. We have shown the system to the Arb Association who, and they agreed it was a very good system, um, but obviously it was the content didn't suit the Arb sector. So <coughs> the concept could transcend into there, but that would be entirely up to the Arb sector to populate that. I think what this is designed for is the commercial chainsaw operator. Uh, what increases in costs would be expected for someone pursuing this system? The, um, the, the main increase in cost would be if you if you chose to go down the digital way of doing that obviously the, the the app would cost you know i have my app say forestry or that is one way of recording that because you have to record your ongoing competence to follow the system if you were decided to go paper based that would be fine as well but that would have a cost i don't know what that is um but in saying that by what if this is run properly and put across properly and it captures the target audience, i.e. The, the professional chainsaw operator, it will then quantify what, who these people are, what skill, skill levels they have, and I hope that we'll be able to attach an industry standard pay grade to that. So if it's one to four, the guys are at level one or girls at level one, they are obviously just coming into the industry, but they still need to be resourced very heavily to support them through that transition. Again, the, uh, the people in 2, 3 have to give up a lot of uh, consumables, vehicles, etc. And in my opinion, people are, who do this type of work are not paid enough. Hmm. And that is why we are where we are. You know, we have to start really engaging with this industry. And if the competency system can produce defined levels of competence, we can then attach defined levels of pay to that and then encourage people to come back into this craft and make it what it once was. With that in mind then, would it the competency system be more like an apprenticeship program than one of certification? It would always follow the uh, the current certification. It, it's not doing anything, it's not replacing anything. All that the competency system was ever designed to do was fill in the gap between the, the training. So rather than this whistle stop tour through to being fully qualified in six weeks, this, this is a, a structured apprenticeship like you say following the training with the um, consolidation periods all the way through that and by the time someone would come out uh, maybe four or five years they would be an extremely competent chainsaw operator rather than being a whistle stop tour and in six weeks time you're as qualified as a, a veteran that's wrong there's no other industry in the world that does that um with your uh, visa background do you know have FISA considered bringing in mandatory annual chainsaw certificate refreshers? No, absolutely not. That That's not. Uh, if anything, FISA are pulling away from chainsaw refresher training. The chainsaw refresher training will still exist. It's still on a three-year basis for the occasional user and a five-year basis for the professional user. So no, that's absolutely not the case. Hmm. This is a bit more hypothetical, but um, if things were to sort of move voluntarily, I suppose, more towards people using this system. Uh, could these changes result in less availability of homegrown skilled workers and subsequently more timber imports? Um, I would hope no. That I would hope because what we do as an industry need to do is we need to start professionalising uh, chainsaw works if we want it to survive. If we don't want it to survive, we just carry on as we are because they're getting depleted but in massive numbers as we speak. And unfortunately, the accident and fatality statistics are not going down. So the chainsaw competency system is designed to empower the people that have vast knowledge and are working safely and maybe refine the, the good operators that are out there. And where we are lacking it is, is the, the knowledge base to cascade that knowledge into the ones that are up, up and coming and empower the guys that are in the twilight of their career, if you like, you know, and, but they know a lot and they've got a lot to offer the industry. Give these guys something back and use that knowledge. Don't just let it disappear. So I, I would envisage if, if we did it properly and followed it properly, that no, I think we will, we will end up with a far superior quality product, i.e. the chainsaw operator. Who declares the person who is signing off on the competency of others to be competent to do so and how is that recognised legally, should anything happen? Well, I guess that's the same as the the person who signs off on your training at the moment because it's an uh, independent assessment. 
So they can only assess what they see on the day. So if that person is not competent on the day, they'll be deemed not competent. If they're competent, they'll be deemed competent. What they do after that process is not the responsibility of that assessor. He's only, it's like an MOT test in your car. You can only do what's available on that day. Mm. And I don't think any of you would be challenged retrospectively if someone decided to do a, a, a picture-perfect audit and then go out and act irresponsibly. That is not the, the responsibility of the assessor or the auditor. Mm. So, so similarly, on the same point, does it not leave a very big responsibility on the person who has to sign off on what other people are competent to do? I would say no. If they're following a, a quality-assured um, system, you know, and, and the person that they audit uh, meets that criteria that's all they have to do and what they do after that they may they may give them action points to focus or focus points that they need to touch up on which you should see within their log books etc as they do their ongoing process so that is the responsibility of the auditor is to to audit that what is put in front of them every time you use the system yourself in your own business has it been discussed with insurance companies and would there be repercussions on the person signing off on someone's competency should they have an accident? In other words, could they use it as an excuse to pass the blame on? I would say no. Uh, we, ha we have to go back to what we, ha we are doing right now. Everybody's insured right now, and we're insured on an independent assessment. And someone can correct me on this, I don't know, but I don't know of any trainers that have been brought up in court uh, and blamed for the competence level of someone who had an accident. Again, they can only train and assess what they're put in front of them at that time. And if they're deemed competent at that time, they're competent. Uh, someone asks of Safe Forestry, is this the app where you send pics? And if so, when do people find time to take pics and videos? What I do with my guys is I pay them obviously to be on site and I make sure that they are paid from the, day, the time they arrive to the time they leave. And I encourage them to take pictures throughout the day to because they have to fill in a logbook every Friday. We finish 20 to 30 minutes early on a Friday. They're paid to, con uh, to fill out their logbook because that information that they give me, which I pay for, is invaluable. So that is how I justify it. And that's how, say and yes, it, Safe Forestry is the app that you take pictures. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, but perhaps you'd like to comment on it. From the people I've spoken to about it, the general consensus seems to be another level of unnecessary bureaucracy, unlikely to benefit anyone except the people administering it, who will probably good, make, make good money off of it. How would you respond to that? Uh, I understand that comment, you know, and uh, but all I can do is assure you that it is not what what the pre uh, to ethos of the competency system is to empower the people involved in it. To, tell, to show the industry these are professionals and that they should be paid accordingly. It is a, a very technical, skilled job. Um, what, we, what we do have to do as an industry is learn from previous mistakes and that the people signing off, as I've heard that a lot in these questions, are genuinely skilled people. And, that, and the real genuinely skilled people are still working because they're genuinely skilled. You know, and very few of them have transitioned into the training side of it. But what we do have to do is capture these guys that are thinking of maybe hanging up their saw, you know, get them into it, the, because these are the guys who know what the actual application is, you know, rather than just saying, here's the training syllabus, do it this way on flat ground, and all of a sudden you're thrown onto the side of a mountain, mm. and it's all different. Mm -hmm. Whereas the guys on the ground or on the side of the mountain, they know that. Mm. So if you go to Canada and all these other places, the, bit, the trainers out there are seven year verified, quantifiable, saw in hand experience. Sit like on the saw before you can even dream about going in there. I'm not saying we can do that, we can't do that. We're not, we're not that lucky to have that kind of skill base here yet. But we need to start realizing that there is the mutual respect between the operator, the auditor, the assessor is, is governed by the skill levels of these people. If there's similar skill levels or better skill levels in the trainers and assessors than the people are training, that mutual respect is straight straight across. But if you have someone operating at a high level on the ground and someone comes in to refresh them and they don't actually know as much as that person, again, it causes a bit of an issue. So if we can, by the running the competency system, if we can target an audience of, say, a thousand cutters in the UK that are commercial cutters that make money every day working a chainsaw, and I'd say that's probably all there is. 
and then try and make, convince them, which is not going to be easy, that the, this system here is going to be verified by people just like you. You know, and it's been built by people just like you, for people like you, to give you a professional outlook and then you will get a bit of credit, you'll get paid accordingly and the next people coming in, it will encourage them to get involved in the competency system because they can see how much they're going to make, how professional they'll be treated and that it'll, they're almost trying to create like a, I don't know, a, a critical mass of really, really good cutters, you know, and a process to get there which has been verified by good people as well. Hmm. You know, so. Well, on talking about veterans um, and veteran cutters, um, we have a comment from a, uh, one who says, woodcutters have no time to be sitting about filling info into some app. 50 years experience as a forestry contractor and I don't think there is any need for this nonsense. Yeah, that, and that's entirely, I, I've heard that as well, you know, I mean, I think actually the first word in there is absolute crap that you forgot to read that out. <laughs> so uh, that's fine. I've heard it's described as significantly worse than that, hmm. you know, and I understand completely. And I have been through there. I worked in this industry when there was no certification, there was no PPE, none of that. So all these changes that come in are generally rebelled against by, by everyone, to be honest, myself included, you know. But I was challenged by the HSE to fix a problem within my business. And this is the way of me fixing my problem. If you don't want to do that and you think it's crap and it doesn't suit you, that's fine. Don't do it. Follow what's already out there. Mm. No one is making you, making you do this, but, but it is a good way of answering a very awkward question. Mm. Um, we, there's been other coverage about safe forestry and it's been mentioned before about other applications that there could be for it. You discovered yourself with COVID that uh, it, it was quite useful for uh, for handling um, challenges that cropped up around that and it's been talked about applying to other uh, industries or areas uh, like boriculture but uh, someone asks about um, forestry machine operation why should it be needed for operators um, the possibility of it being applied in that direction is certification not adequate enough for machine operators as the person signing off may not be as competent as the person they are assessing yeah that's um, a, an ongoing theme, I would say, through the competency system. And to answer that question from a personal, uh, from my business, we do it all. Our, we don't have a competency system for the machine operators, but what we do have is every machine operator, irrespective of how qualified they are, they fill out a logbook every week. So I have guys who've worked for 35 years in machines fill out quite happily fill out a logbook on a Friday. They're being paid to do it. But then I can prove if I'm ever challenged, is that old guy there competent? And I say, well, here's his competence up to this point. There's a certification, which has been asked in the question, but here's a little bit more. Now that's what I deem appropriate within my business. If you want to go with certification only, that's fine. It's entirely up to you. You're not being you're meeting compliance. But if you're ever challenged on something that happens and you have to prove the competence of that operator, this system will give you more. But again, entirely up to you. Hmm. And a question on Safe Forestry. What was the timeline for the launch? Safe Forestry has launched, right. absolutely. Um, uh, we're refining it a bit more at the moment. We're, we're, what we are really trying to do with Safe Forestry is um, we're trying to get it to work offline so that if you have no signal at all you can still take pictures and submit these forms and then when you receive signal it caches that material back up in so you're still working in real time but you're not seeing it um, the launch of the the competency system um, FISA has hosted the outline of what the competency system will hopefully look like so that's a draft hmm. and that is if you like where we want to get to how we get there when we get there, nobody knows. If we get there, nobody knows. But well, this is where we would like to get to. That, that's where I am, you know, and I'm working on how I do all the bits in between, and I'm sharing that information with industry because I know the challenge that was put to me hmm. to, show, to be show the competence of my operators. So if I can share that information with industry, it might help people get there themselves, you know. But I understand completely the concerns that everybody's got you know, and I, I, all I can do is reassure you that this is not going to land on your, on your desk and say you must do this because that's not fair because we're not showing you how you do this. So I'm working on the how at the moment and I'm going to share that with everyone as, and all the, 
warts and all, you know, and how difficult it's been, you know, some operators just absolutely refuse to do it, you know, and so there's workarounds to try and get that bit of extra competence in them, you know, some phones work, some phones don't, there's, there's all these things, you know, and you might decide I'd rather go paper based, so that's fine, you know, there's the option to go that way, so all the if, buts, maybes, whys need filled out, just, just relax and let us get there, help us get there, that would be really helpful, because if we could get, all work together to get there, we would be in a stronger position. And we might save the chainsaw operators, because don't think for any minute that we're not on the cusp of this going wrong as ch for chainsaw operators. Well, that's all the questions I have for today. As things progress, I'm sure many people will have more questions. Uh, would you talk to me again to answer some of them? Absolutely. I look forward to that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Callum. You're welcome.